History tells the story of the world and of our lives. Sometimes that history goes bump in the night. Broadcasting from the center of oddity and the supernatural in Central Florida, it's the History Goes Bump podcast. Hello, you spectacular people. Welcome to this 557th episode of the History Ghost Bump podcast, Ghost Tours for the Theater of the Mind. I'm your host, Diane. And this is Kelly. Kelly, on this episode, we're going to be doing something that people absolutely love, the life and afterlife of someone. This person was amazingly talented, but also had an incredibly tragic life, and that is Karen Carpenter. Looking forward to covering her life and afterlife. Big fan of the Carpenters. How about you? Absolutely. And not afraid to admit it. No, not at all. We do want to give a warning here for anyone who might be triggered from discussions about eating disorders. You are not going to want to listen to the show. I'll just tell you that right now. If it's going to cause you any issues, don't listen because we're going to get into it pretty heavily. Before we get into talking about her life and afterlife, we want to welcome into the Spooktacular crew, Jerrica. Thank you so much for joining the Spooktacular crew. And now this moment, Noddity. Stonehenge in Wiltshire, England is a prehistoric megalithic structure. There have been various theories as to its purpose. At one time, it was thought to be the remains of a druid temple, or a burial monument, or possibly a meeting place for the people of the time. The most recent studies have proposed that Stonehenge enabled people to measure the skies like a modern-day observatory, allowing the users to predict celestial events and the equinox. This enabled the users to better plan for their agricultural, social, and religious needs. Nobody knows how the enormous stones were put into place, with the heaviest weighing over 20 tons and the average blue stones weighing about 2 tons. There is an altar stone that lies near the middle of the stone circle. Through chemical analysis, it was recently determined to have not been sourced from whales like the monument's blue stones. Instead, the grey-green sandstone was discovered to have likely come from northeast Scotland. There are various theories as to how the giant stones were brought to the monument. Some were sourced as close as 15 miles away. The smaller pillar stones came from 140 miles away. But the altar stone traveled a distance of over 450 miles. And that certainly is odd. Pull the covers up tight. That chill you feel isn't the air conditioning. (laughs) And now, this month in history. In the month of September, on the 20th in 1873, the New York Stock Exchange closed for the first time in its history. The event was caused by the financial panic of 1873. The stock market had crashed in Europe, which prompted New York to shut down the American exchange for 10 days. These incidents began the first Great Depression, which lasted from 1873 until 1879. Americans sold their investments, banks failed, and the railway industry collapsed. Throughout the time, there was a 14% increase in unemployment and almost 20,000 businesses declared bankruptcy. After the Civil War, currency consisted of specie, which were metal coins like gold and silver. There were also greenbacks that were issued by the government, and they were not fully backed by gold. Paper money did not have the American people's trust behind it, and the greenbacks are thought to have greatly contributed to the Panic of 1873. Karen Carpenter was one half of the Carpenters, a brother and sister singing duo that sold over 150 million records and they had 17 hits. She was an amazing drummer and singer. Her voice had no equal. 
but despite her amazing talent, she was a tortured soul that suffered from an eating disorder at a time when such things were misunderstood and it eventually took her life. And quite possibly that might be why her spirit is at unrest. Join us as we share the history and hauntings of Karen Carpenter. people, especially of the younger persuasion, may think of the Carpenter's music as just being cheesy, easy listening songs. But the siblings were musical geniuses. Get ready for me to gush. (laughs) (laughs) I have loved the Carpenters from the time I was a kid. And I love the fact that Karen was a contralto because I myself sing at a lower level. I don't sing well, but I sing at a lower level. You sing just fine. And when we would take music in school, I don't even know if they do that nowadays. Do kids even have to take music in school? Um, I don't know if they're required. It was required when I was in elementary school. Yeah, we definitely had to take it in elementary school. You learn how to play the recorder. <laughs> and in middle school, we had to do choir and stuff. So I would sing in the choir. And I even remember in church, I would try to be a part of the choir, too, even though I literally cannot carry it to. And I know you're being nice, Kelly. But, you know, the teacher would always be like, you know, sing higher. Try to get your your voice higher. And I don't I don't know why they would do that to girls, I guess, because you're a girl, you should be singing soprano. And I just it wasn't it's not me. I can't do it. I would be listening to the Carpenter's music. And I'm like, oh, it's a girl who sings low at a lower register like me where it's comfortable. Karen died when I was 12, and I remember not understanding what exactly an eating disorder was. The made-for-TV movie The Karen Carpenter Story featuring actress Cynthia Gibb in the title role came out in 1989. Did you see that? I did. And I remember watching it, and at that point, I was a little bit more familiar with eating disorders. I don't know about you, Kelly, but I feel like when I got into high school, they started talking about it a little bit more. Definitely. And they would kind of tell you what it was about. And I just remember being like, why would somebody starve themselves to death or eat a bunch of food and then throw up afterward? And I remember there was another movie that came out with Meredith Baxter Burney that was about specifically bulimia. It kind of came out at about the same time. And I realized at that time what a tragic figure Karen had become because you didn't really, since you didn't know what an eating disorder was, you didn't really understand what was going on with her life. And then you watch that show. And believe me, that made-for-TV movie didn't even get into the half of it because it had to get past her family who didn't want people to know all this stuff. So it really didn't get into how bad it really was. But I realized at that time she was this very tragic figure. I had no idea at the time how personal eating disorders would become for me. I'm going to talk about some stuff here that I have never talked about before on the podcast. So bear with me for just a minute. I was in a relationship for 24 years with a person who suffered from both anorexia and bulimia. This is something that people don't just get over, and it's probably the most difficult type of addiction mental health issue to deal with because we have to eat to live. So a person suffering from an eating disorder has to learn how to eat in a healthy way while trying to recover. So it's basically like asking somebody who is a drug addict or an alcoholic, well, you can keep drinking the alcohol, but you have to learn how to drink just a little bit and drink it in a healthy way or take your drug in a healthy way. Not that any drug would ever be healthy to take, but it's kind of the same thought. My ex's eating disorder started at the same time as Karen Carpenter's, which was a time where nobody understood why these people wouldn't just eat. Why would they starve themselves? The medical industry had no idea what to do to help these people. They were only really concerned with getting pounds back on people. Eventually, mental health professionals realized that people with eating disorders don't see themselves in an accurate way and that there were very deep psychological issues. For Karen Carpenter, many of her whys for going this route began with her relationship with her mother, and for my ex, that was very much the reason as well. For the most part, my ex was able to live a relatively normal life and would speak at schools about the issue, but there were times she would struggle, and I can say that when we split up, It was very difficult for me to make that decision because I was worried that the eating disorder would rear its ugly head, but we can't stay in a relationship that isn't working for us because we are worried what will happen to the other person. Many of you have dealt with people who struggle with addictions, and there really is nothing we can do. A person has to get well for themselves. And that was the case with Karen. She had to get well for herself, and she just couldn't get there 
And it's so sad because one can only wonder how much more amazing music she could have created through the years. Karen Ann Carpenter was born on March 2, 1950, in New Haven, Connecticut. She was a second child of Harold and Agnes Carpenter. Her older brother Richard had been born four years prior. The siblings liked the arts, and Karen began ballet and tap dancing at the age of four. She was more of a tomboy and enjoyed playing softball outside, while Richard was quiet and stayed inside learning to play the piano. The piano was something he hated when he was being classically trained. But when he switched to playing by ear and a teacher who gave him freedom, Richard turned out to be a prodigy. The family moved from Connecticut to Los Angeles, California in 1963 because Harold had been offered a job there. When Karen started at Downey High School in 1964, she decided to join the school marching band. And the... (laughs) (laughs) I knew you were going to laugh the minute you saw this part. (laughs) Says the ex-band geek. And the conductor gave her the glockenspiel to play. <laughs> How can you even say glockenspiel without laughing? <laughs> Named oh, it that. Oh my. And Downey is where I was born. So if I had actually been raised there, I would have been in that same band probably. Well, what's really cool is when I mentioned to you something about Downey, you were like, well, that's where I was born. And I'm like, nah. And you were <laughs> like, yeah. And I'm like, oh my gosh, that's where she grew up and died. This was an instrument that she didn't care for. <laughs> Shockingly. And she longingly watched others playing the drums. One of those people was her best friend, Frankie Chavez. And he convinced Karen's parents to buy her a $300 Ludwig drum set. And he taught her how to play. And you can imagine we're back here in the 60s and she's watching all the boys playing the drums because that's not a girl thing to do. And that's probably part of the reason why they're like, no, I don't know about letting you play the drums. But they did let her. And She was really kind of a pioneer for women playing drums. That's awesome. A lot of people don't stop to think that that's where she got her start. During these early years, it became clear to Karen that her mother favored Richard, so much so that she didn't feel as though her mother loved her at all. Agnes has been described as a controlling matriarch, and it was Richard's talent that the family focused on, and the Carpenters did whatever they could to put forward his musical career. Karen's first foray into performing with a musical group was in high school, when she and two other girls formed the band Two Plus Two. I don't know where they got the name from because there was three of them. (laughs) (laughs) Was it really? I'm pretty sure Two two Plus Two is four, but (laughs) maybe they had another girl who quit early on. I don't know. The band was short-lived, maybe because of the name. Actually, it was because when they finally booked their first gig, one of the girls' mothers wouldn't let her go. Oh, man. (laughs) I can't even imagine. You're like, we got our first big gig and we can't do it. In 1965, Richard invited Karen to join him and a college friend in a band he formed and named for himself, the Dick Carpenter Trio. They got several gigs in jazz nightclubs and even signed a contract with RCA Records to produce two instrumental records. Those records were never released. Karen and Richard were invited to audition for bassist Joe Osborne, who would become part of the Wrecking Crew. This is a well-known session musician group back in the day. Osborne wasn't really impressed with Richard, but he liked Karen on the drums. And when he asked her to sing, he got very excited and signed her to his label. Karen was five foot four inches when she graduated from high school in 1967, and she was a relatively healthy weight at 150 pounds. But she felt as though she were chubby, so she started something called the Stillman Water Diet. This was a high protein, low carbohydrate, low fat diet that called for eight glasses of water a day as well, which is a normal amount that we should be drinking, but. (laughs) Yeah, and it actually. Sounds like a fairly healthy diet to me. It's pretty much what I eat, although I do eat higher fat. That's true. Not so much low fat. Basically, a fairly healthy way to lose weight. Karen enrolled as a music major at Long Beach State, where Richard was attending, and she joined him in the college choir. Karen had also been studying drum technique with Bill Douglas, who was a jazz drummer with Benny Goodman. The choir director immediately noticed the extraordinary instrument that was Karen's voice, and he took her under his wing and trained her to have a three-octave range. The Carpenter siblings decided to form a new band at this time that they called Spectrum. They did a lot of experimenting and recording in Joe Osborne's garage studio, but nothing really came out of it record-wise. The siblings decided to enter a TV talent show in 1968 and performed Dancing in the Street. It really showcased Karen's drumming talent and the siblings won the finals. 
you will be able to find this on YouTube. Look it up. It is great to watch her drum and she does a great job. And then A&M Records came calling and signed the siblings to a recording contract in 1969. Karen played drums, a little bass, and was co-lead singer on their first album, Ticket to Ride. The title song was a Beatles song that became a hit for the Carpenters, and it hit number 54 on the Billboard Hot 100. The next album, Close to You, was even bigger with two hits. They long to be close to you. I love that song. (laughs) I do too. And We've Only Just Begun. The latter was a song that was written for a bank commercial by Paul Williams and Roger Nichols. Paul Williams was also under contract with A&M Records, and Richard ran into him at the studio and asked if there was a full-length version of the song. There was, and as we all know, that song went on to be one of the greatest hits for the Carpenters and their signature song. And let me just say, it's really great to hear this story from Paul Williams' perspective, because he said, even if we didn't have a full-length version of that song, and I had them coming to me, and we were going to get this maybe up in the top 100, he's like, we would have written the rest of that song. Right. (laughs) So he's like, there was no way I was going to tell him no. We've Only Just Begun hit number two on the U.S. Billboard Hot 100 right behind the Jackson 5's I'll Be There in 1970. May 1971 brought a third studio album, Carpenters, with the songs, For All We Know, Rainy Days and Mondays, and Superstar, the greatest Carpenter song of all time. (laughs) <laughs> fight me. I'm not going to fight you. <laughs> fight me. <laughs> I don't know what any of you go ahead out there listening to us on your headphones somewhere, your earbuds, yell out. What is your favorite Carpenter song? If it's not Superstar, don't yell it. <laughs> oh, good grief. Everybody has a favorite. That is definitely mine. It's like, wow, what an amazing song. The arrangements that Richard came up with showcased her beautiful voice. And anytime you hear people talking about her voice, it's like, it's not even like butter. It's just soothing. It just, it is. It just makes you feel good. June 1972 featured a song for you. The fourth studio album with songs Hurting Each Other, It's Gonna Take Some Time, Goodbye to Love, Top of the World, I Won't Last a Day Without You, and Bless the Beasts and Children. Karen saw herself as a drummer who also happened to sing. She even ranked higher than John Bonham in a 1975 Playboy poll about best drummers. Let me just say, he was not happy about that at all. And he said (laughs) she couldn't last. I've heard it said both five minutes and 10 minutes with a Led Zeppelin song. I have to say, John Bonham is my favorite drummer of all time. So I do think he's the best. But I think she could run a pretty good uh, contest against him. (laughs) So she liked her spot back behind the drums. But she was fun-sized like Diane. I mean, five foot four. (laughs) Yes. So it was hard for people to see her when she was singing. And it was decided that Karen needed to get out from behind the drums. Mouseketeer Cubby O'Brien took over at the drums. This put Karen as the focal point on stage, and she was uncomfortable with that. On top of that, she now would see herself in pictures. A photo from an August 1973 Lake Tahoe concert made Karen think that she looked fat, so she hired a personal trainer. He suggested she try a low-calorie, high-carb diet. And I don't know how those two things go together, because a high-carb diet, I think, would be full of calories. Yeah. She lifted weights and started bulking up, which made her feel like she was fatter. She and Richard sat down and watched themselves on a Bob Hope television special in the fall, and she asked Richard if he thought she looked heavier. He said, yes. Karen fired her trainer, bought a hip cycle, and started limiting her calories. The Carpenters left on tour, and and she said of eating on the road, When you're on the road, it's hard to eat, period. On top of that, it's rough to eat well. We don't like to eat before a show because I can't stand singing with a full stomach. You never get to dinner until, like, midnight. And if you eat heavy, you're not going to sleep, and you're going to be a balloon. Which is all true. I mean, being on the road is not a healthy lifestyle at all. And now a little break for a word about one of our sponsors. Karen initially lost 20 pounds, and the sister of an old boyfriend told her that she looked fabulous. And she did. And that would have been great had she stopped there. But she didn't. 
Now, around this same time, Richard is going to start having his own problems with a different form of addiction. He started taking quaaludes, and he really ended up heavily addicted to those. Between the issues both siblings were dealing with, concerts started being canceled. In 1979, Richard checked himself into rehab and took a year off from touring. Karen decided to try her hand on a solo album, and she recorded with producer Phil Ramone in New York. A&M Records shelved the album, even though Quincy Jones came forward and asked A&M Records co-owner Herb Albert if he could remix the album. So Quincy wow. must have heard it, and he's like, this is good, it just needs some remixing. A&M wouldn't budge, and they even charged Karen $400,000 to cover the cost of recording. Oh, my word. And that was going to be paid out from the Carpenters' future royalties. The solo album was eventually released in total in 1996 under the title Karen Carpenter, and it was received very well. People said it could compete against any of the women at that time that were singing like Barbara Streisand and such. And before that, the reason why I said in total there is because that was the first time that the whole thing came out. They would release a song here and there after her death. Karen had many friends and enjoyed going out with them, and she often would hide the fact that she wasn't eating her food at restaurants by offering lots of taste to everybody and by pushing her food around and hiding it. She would wear clothes that were too big so that people wouldn't see she was real thin. She would wear tighter and sexier clothing on stage, and her manager Sherwin Bash was horrified when he saw how skeletal she had become. Audiences would gasp when she took the stage because she was so gaunt. A lot of them were wondering if she was dying of cancer. Karen's relationship with her mother continued to deteriorate through this time. When Agnes would be eating with Karen, she would scoop food onto her plate when she noticed her passing off her meal to others. Randy Schmidt shares in the biography he wrote about Karen Carpenter, Little Girl Blue, about a time that a family friend spotted Karen sunbathing topless outside. That friend said, they put this screen around her so nobody else would see her. She loved to go lay out in the sunshine. I don't know whether it was to get tan or to get away from her mother. Anyhow, I happened to go out to the kitchen for something and I saw her out there. She just had on little bathing suit shorts. You couldn't tell whether it was a girl or a boy. She had absolutely no breasts. The occasional friend would encourage Karen to get help, but Karen always said she had no problem. And her family was no help as Agnes insisted that the family could take care of themselves. And she certainly didn't want any shame brought on the family. Anorexia is about control, and this seemed to be the only thing Karen at least felt that she had control over. Clearly, she didn't have any control over that either. She would think that she could control what she ate, which probably eased her pain that she couldn't get her mother to love her, and Richard, you know, he's controlling the music, so... The only time Agnes seemed to pay any attention to Karen was when she was real thin and in failing health. Agnes would nurse her back to health at those times, so you can definitely see where it might have been to get her mother's attention to. Karen was terribly lonely in love as well. In 1980, she met a property developer called Tom Burris, and the two began a whirlwind romance that led to them getting married within two months. Before the wedding, a friend asked Karen if she was sure about rushing into a marriage. But Karen was desperate for love, and she also wanted to get pregnant. The wedding was almost called off when Karen found out that Tom had a vasectomy. He promised to reverse the procedure, but Karen told her mother that she was going to cancel the wedding. Agnes told her that she would do no such thing because this would embarrass the family, and all these people were traveling to come to the wedding. And the wedding had already been paid for. So Karen married Burris, and it was an awful union. Burris was broke, and he spent most of Karen's money while he emotionally abused her, saying that she was an ugly bag of bones. He also informed her that he wasn't going to have children with her. Karen filed for divorce in 1981. A devastated carpenter fell further into her eating disorder, and she withered down to just 90 pounds. And before she'd gotten married to this Tom Burris guy, she had dated quite a few celebrity men. So it wasn't that she wasn't dating anybody, but she just didn't find anybody that she could really, you know, connect with. Karen was using a variety of techniques to drop weight, from over-exercising, to taking thyroid medication, to taking fistfuls of laxatives up to 90 tablets a night. Oh, my word. I don't even know how you Ugh. swallow that many pills. I remember talking about the Marilyn Monroe show that we did, and that she supposedly had all of those pills that were in her, and it was like, it's not even humanly possible to swallow that much. But here, Karen is showing you, I, I might be possible to swallow that much if you're, I mean, I can't even imagine that's basically the whole box of laxatives in one night. The Carpenters left for a European tour in October of 1981. While doing an interview on BBC television, 
Karen was asked about rumors floating around that she had anorexia. Karen just said she was fine, but tired. The interviewer said that reports claimed she had gotten down to six stone in weight, which is 84 pounds. Karen became agitated and said that that was untrue. But perhaps this broke through a bit because after returning home, Karen set out on a year-long recovery. And if you watch this BBC interview, if you can find it on YouTube, I mean, she looks awful. Just awful. If she would have seen herself in everybody else's eyes, right? she would have seen just how bad it had gotten. Because she... She was a beautiful woman. And when you see her in this interview, it's like, wow, just it was basically a skeleton with skin over it. She started seeing a psychotherapist named Stephen Levencron, who had written a book on eating disorders called The Best Little Girl in the World. He took the thyroid medication away from Karen. He was horrified when he found out that she was taking that and she didn't need it. And she was like overtaking it. Like I take thyroid medication every day because my thyroid, they had to kill part of it. So I have to take some of it. And I mean, they're very like, you only take this much and they do blood tests all the time to make sure you're getting the right amount. So if you don't need to take it and then you're overtaking it, she was probably making her heart race like you wouldn't believe. She started purging to continue her weight management. This does happen to a lot of people who have anorexia and then they start eating again. Then they start doing the bulimia thing because then it's like, okay, I'm eating. See, I'm eating. And then in secret, they're throwing up. The Carpenter family flew to New York to do a therapy session with Karen. And Agnes refused to tell her daughter she loved her when prompted by Levencron. Oh, my God. So they're doing a family therapy session. And of course, Richard's saying, of course, I love you, Karen. Of course, I want you to get well and everything. And then the doctor looks over at Agnes and is like, and you, Agnes? Well, that's just not the way we do things. How terrible. The way you do things is to not tell your daughter that you, you love her, especially when she really, really, really needs to hear it. Richard, for his part, tried many times to help Karen, but he couldn't understand the disorder. He, I guess he just didn't look at it as being the same thing that he had to deal with. He would try to love on her, and then he would try cajoling her, and then he would try anger and yelling. But after this meeting, the family returned to California and gave up. Almost unbelievably, Karen starved herself down to a low of 77 pounds. She was hospitalized in September of 1982 with an irregular heartbeat and dizziness. The hospital got her up 30 pounds, and she maintained a steady weight after this, but her heart had clearly been damaged by the starvation and medication abuse. She returned to California after being released. Carpenter attended a gathering of past Grammy Award winners in January of 1983, and Dionne Warwick said that she seemed upbeat and exclaimed, Look at me, I've got an ass! (laughs) She also said she had a lot of living to do and was excited to start working on music. She met with Richard on February 1st, 1983 to discuss new projects, and this would be the last time the siblings saw each other. On the morning of the 4th, Karen got up early to prepare for the signing of her divorce papers, and she collapsed on the floor of a walk-in closet at her parents' house. Her mother found her and called 911. Paramedics found her in cardiac arrest with a heartbeat every 10 seconds. She was rushed to Downey Community Hospital, where she was pronounced dead. She was 32 years old. The coroner ruled she died from emetine cardiotoxicity, which was basically Ipecac poisoning. Ipecac is a drug used to induce vomiting, and Karen had apparently been using it to control her weight. That kind of abuse causes the heart muscle to dissolve. And I don't even know that it had that warning on the package. They don't actually expect people to use this other than in emergency situations. Usually you have that in your medicine cabinet in case of poisoning to get somebody to throw up. We can never know, but if Karen had suffered from her eating disorder today, she would probably not have died. Paul McCartney said of Carpenter, she had the best female voice in the world, melodic, tuneful, and distinctive. Many female artists claim to have been influenced by Karen, and there's no doubt that she was one of the greatest voices in history. Drummers heap praise on her for her drum skills as well. Her death was not in vain, as it brought anorexia nervosa onto center stage, and her family started the Karen A. Carpenter Memorial Foundation to raise money for research on eating disorders. And I believe it's because of this. This is why we got to learn about anorexia and stuff when we were in school. I think that's why they really brought it out there. And now let's talk a little bit about her possible afterlife. One can't miss the Jim Henson Company lot that's located at 1416 North La Brea Avenue in Los Angeles. Kermit the Frog towers above the front gate and he's wearing Charlie Chaplin's The Champ Suit, holding a cane and tipping his bowler hat. It's very cute. (laughs) I want to see that in person someday. 
And there's a reason for that, because this property was established as Charlie Chaplin Studios in 1917 by the actor. Chaplin wrote in his autobiography, I decided to buy land in Hollywood and build one. The site was the corner of Sunset and La Brea and had a very fine 10-room house and five acres of lemon, orange, and peach trees. I didn't know they had peach trees in California. I told you I used to grow Babcock peaches. Well, I forgot. (laughs) (laughs) We built a perfect unit complete with developing plant, cutting room, and offices. Chaplin built his studio in the English cottage style, and a large orchard was torn out for a back lot where large outdoor sets could be built. There was already a large home on the property that Chaplin was going to use as his personal residence, but it instead was used by studio personnel and his brother, Sidney. Most of Chaplin's classic films were shot here. Chaplin sold the studio in 1953 to a group that planned to tear down the studio, but they decided to lease it to television production company Kling Studios. The Adventures of Superman, with another one of our life and afterlifes, George Reeves, was filmed here. Red Skelton bought the studio in 1960. In 1967, this became A&M Records and served that purpose until 1999. Jim Henson's kids bought the studio in 2000 to be the new home of the Jim Henson Company. And the last thing I saw is that they might be selling it, so it might be going to somebody else. For 30 years, the A&M Studios was one of the top studios in Hollywood. Studio 2 was the favorite studio for Richard and Karen Carpenter. Christopher Ward is a songwriter who has written songs for Hilary Duff, Diana Ross, the Backstreet Boys, Winona Judd, and Alana Miles. And the song he wrote for her was Black Velvet. Which I love, because it's about (laughs) Elvis. Yes. On his website, he shares... A few years before that, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers had been recording in Studio 2, and things just kept going wrong. Nothing major, but enough to derail the process and necessitate a series of calls to studio maintenance. A buzz here, a faulty patch there, funky headphone sound. Death by a thousand cuts. The band didn't want to abandon the room they were all comfortable in, but eventually it was beyond nuisance level, and no one had a solution. Then someone suggested consulting a spiritual advisor. Karen Carpenter's ghost is unhappy, they were informed by the consultant. And as a remedy, it would be necessary to install a sizable crystal in one of the studio walls. And the crystal had to be lit 24-7. Done. Tech issue solved. Happy heartbreakers. Recording resumed. I found myself working there because Diana Ross asked me to record a gospel choir for the song Hope is an Open Window, which Tim Tickner and I wrote with her and were producing for Diana. Since the album was done and time was tight, Diana wanted the choir recorded by Friday. The call came on Wednesday. Our project coordinator booked us into the crystal room at A&M. Fortunately, the session went off without a hitch. The crystal did its job. The choir sang beautifully and Diana loved it. I don't know if the crystal's still there, but somehow I suspect it is. It seems to me it would fit nicely in Muppet World. A former employee at the Jim Henson Studios said, When I worked there, I was told specifically never to turn off the light on the crystal in B because Karen's ghost would get mad. Ghost hunters investigated the studios in 2007, and one piece of evidence they captured was an EVP of what sounded like a woman muttering, and a lot of them thought that it was Karen. Of course, there could be lots of other things that are haunting this location because it was a film studio. Charlie Chittenden Paranormal did a ghost box session in 2016 and tried to contact Karen. There was a female voice that came through, and he said it sounded like, I love them. I heard the love part, but not sure what the rest was. It could have been her voice. It did sound a little bit like Karen to me, and it might not have been. (laughs) You know, who knows when you've got a ghost box coming over. Jim Harold had a listener join him on the campfire in 2012, and this listener saw the full-bodied apparition of Karen. Oh, wow. Tim Jackson was filming a video at the Bergen Performing Arts Center in which Cynia Buzina and Leonid and friends were performing the song Superstar. Jackson writes, A very odd thing happened when I was videoing the newest song from Cynia Buzina and Leonid and friends. Cynia appeared to be a ghostly figure while the other members did not. Cynia mentioned that Richard Carpenter had heard their version and loved it. And maybe this was the way of Karen making her presence known on stage with Cynia. It probably was just a lighting thing, but it was very odd looking. And I'll go ahead. I was watching the video and I did a screen capture from it. And I will put that up on Instagram. And it is weird because you could see everybody else in the band just fine. It's not a great color on them. But I mean, she's like glowing. Yeah, she's glowing just 
like a white light. Yeah, it's not like having a spotlight on you. It's like she is an angel that's standing there on stage glowing. I've never seen a picture like this before. It could just be some kind of weird lighting thing, but interesting. And yeah, I mean, it, she was singing the best song the Carpenters ever put out. <laughs> so Fight me. <laughs> Karen Carpenter once said of anorexia, it's like being haunted. It's the worst thing in the world. Clearly, she was very haunted by the spirit of anorexia. Is that why she may still be around in the afterlife? Is the ghost of Karen haunting places? That is for you to decide. And for any of you young people who have not listened to any Carpenter's music, you have an assignment. Sit down and listen to some Carpenter's music. You will appreciate it. Even if you're into hard rock and roll and all that other stuff, you will enjoy it. I guarantee you. Very tragic story. Yes, it absolutely is. And and I do truly feel like if she'd been struggling nowadays, she would have been able to get the help she needed. They just didn't know what to do back then. And it was a lot of experimentation and that kind of thing. And she just kind of fell through the cracks. And it's just awful, horrible disease. And for those of you who might need some help with an eating disorder, the National Eating Disorders Helpline is 1-800-931-2237. Or you can text NEDA to 741-741. Love to have you guys check out our website at historygoesbump.com. And if you'd like to send us some feedback, you can do that at historygoesbump at gmail.com. We did get an email from Dan. He said, hello, ladies. I wanted to drop you a line and say thanks for the Hot Springs episode. It brought back a lot of memories, especially the part on the poet's loft. I was lucky enough to know T. To say he was a gifted man would truly be an understatement. He was not only a performer, he was also the loft master. So he ran the place when I was there, and he ran it with Jenny. She was the young lady that Ghost Lab interviewed. She was T's former fiancé. They were a powerhouse together. And yes, the poet's loft was haunted as hell, as is Hot Springs. This was the place where I went from being a hardcore skeptic, the type that, yeah, okay, did you take your meds today, to being, oh hell, this may be real, after an experience thought that was really cool. There was somebody who actually knew T and probably knew about the experiences people were having with him. I want to thank you guys for tuning into this episode. I've been your host, Diane. And this has been Kelly. You take care now. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. This episode is brought to you by our executive producers. Want to keep the spooks away? Give us a review. spectacular people welcome to this 557th episode of the history goes bump bot bo- bo- podcast it's, it's the podcast <laughs> hey bob, hey, bob. <laughs> oh my gosh <laughs> stop it get out of my head i'm bob and this is my other brother bob <laughs> there you go daryl <laughs>